The front yard looked like it had a mole infestation, but there were no little heaps of dirt around the holes, just perfectly clean circles on the ground, like a cake poked over and over with a pencil. No one believed the Hudsons that there was a giant metal stake hovering over their property. No one, except me of course. I know a thing or two about unidentified flying objects. I observed the ruined lawn from the gate as I waited, stretching my legs that cramped from the long drive to the house in the middle of nowhere. Logan came out of the tool shed to my right and danced around the circles to reach me. Mr. Ortega, I'm so glad you could come, he said. Please, call me Ted. As we walked to the house, I saw some damage on a concrete path where the needle also must have struck. The house seemed intact. For now. His wife Tara served up some tea. They were both in their forties. Childless. We are so glad you're here, Ted. No one believes us. The police came a few times. Hell, we even called the local priest. But prayers don't help. It just won't leave us alone. Logan said. Calm down, honey. His wife said, squeezing Logan's shoulder. She continued instead of him. We hope that you can help us. We don't know what to do anymore. And we don't want to move out. We love this place. They said you hunt aliens? Do you think we're dealing with aliens, Ted? I'm just a guy with a blog about UFOs. I corrected her. If there is something here, I'd like to try and film it. I pointed to the back with my equipment. But that might take some time. I'll need to stay here with you for several days. Just need a bed and some food, as I told you over the phone. You're welcome to stay, Logan and Tara said, almost in unison. Great, I said and pulled out my notepad. So, how did this all start? The Hudsons have been living on the property for three years. Everything was normal, they said, up until four months ago. When they first saw the needle, it was snowing outside, Logan recalled. He was going to get some firewood when all of a sudden, something appeared about five feet ahead of him. It made no noise. He described it as a large metal pole. Part of it had dug itself into the ground. The object did not stay there long. A few seconds maybe. Then it rose, and Logan could see the strange thing in its entirety. It looks like a giant sewing needle, a sharp point at the bottom, a cylindrical body, except at the top it has two holes, or eyes I guess, one under the other, two elongated eyes. I began to shake with fear, dropped the firewood and ran back inside, Logan said. Terry and I watched it through the window, it hovered above the same spot for a few minutes, and then it just vanished. I've heard about cigar-shaped UFOs, even saw one back in 09, but not ones that look like sewing needles. That did sound strange. Logan said they saw the needle many times since then, but he never managed to snap a photo of it. I always have my phone ready, Terra too, and we have a digital camera we bought recently but it just disappears before we can even capture it. The only evidence left behind is the holes. You see now why no one believes us? Why we need someone to prove that we're not crazy? There was, he said, a sort of fear that gripped them whenever the needle appeared that they couldn't quite explain. We went outside and they showed me the holes. There were 21 of them in total. My measurements showed that each one was identical. 12 inches in diameter, 34 inches deep. That gave me a rough idea about how big the object was. The needle seemed to strike at random locations, not all on the soft ground. The concrete path that meandered from the gate to the house was damaged in two places. When I asked if they had tried communicating with the object somehow, Logan said that he had yelled at it a few times in frustration, but was too afraid to come closer. I set my equipment around the property, pointed the cameras at the location where the most activity seems to have taken place, 
between the house and the tool shed and set them up to record any movement. Now we wait, I thought. Over dinner, I got to know the Hudsons a bit better. They both worked remotely for the same company. That's the reason they ran away from the city to these woods, as they put it. We love it here. The peace, the fresh air, Logan said. In the absence of other people, Tara added. They were the kind of couple that liked to finish each other's sentences. I wasn't sure what exactly annoyed me about that. They seemed like normal people in a loving marriage. Perhaps it was the fact that I've never had a relationship that lasted more than a year or so. I guess I had envied them in a way. As if reading my thoughts, Tara asked, You married, Ted? Girlfriend? Nope, I said. Broke up with someone recently. Things will fix themselves. You'll see, said Tara. I nodded, as if I got her meaning. To change the subject, I asked if they knew who had lived on the property before them. Logan told me that they had contacted the son of the previous owner. He had no clue what we were talking about. Did you perhaps disturb something? Dig something up from the ground? No, nothing like that, Logan said. Do you think that the object... Uh, the needle wants to hurt you. There was a pause while he thought it over. I don't know. It never attacked us. It just pokes holes in the ground. But I'm scared shitless when I see it. Sometimes even before I can see it. I don't know what it wants. Logan said. Tear aside. We just want to go back to normal. And you're pinning your hopes on a guy with a block to prove that you're not crazy. I thought. I remember now Logan's first email, saying that he had read my blog, especially the post about cigar-shaped UFOs and that they're having trouble with a similar sort of object. What surprised me even more was the quick response when I asked if I could come over and try to film it. People don't understand what it's like, Tara said, to have this absurd object floating around. And they never will if they don't see the problem through our eyes. A few glasses of wine later, I felt a bit lightheaded. I usually tolerate alcohol well. Maybe it's the long ride, I thought. What do you think about our needle? Logan asked. I don't know. Never saw anything like what you've described, I said. Well, if you had to guess, what would you say it is? Said Tara. Maybe it's a drone. I heard myself saying. The wine was kicking in faster than I thought it would. Tara raised an eyebrow. Drone? If it's alien. I mean, think about it. If we could go to another planet, we would send robots there first to get soil samples, take photos and so on. Maybe aliens do that too in a way. They were quiet for an uncomfortable moment. Just a wild guess, of course. I added. But what does it want from us? Asked Logan. I looked at the window and into the darkness outside. Perhaps it's just here to do its job. Whatever it is. And then it'll go away. Maybe you're unimportant to it. I said. Unimportant? Tara said. Think about it this way. When you plant a flower or a tree, you don't care what the insects think that live in that dirt. But you do disturb them. Maybe it's like that. Maybe a much more advanced intelligent life form sees us as ants and couldn't care less about what we think. And by contrast, we can't comprehend what they're doing or why. I said. The rest of the evening was preserved in my memory only in fragments. I know we went outside at some point and took turns looking through my night goggles. The stars spun as I looked up aimlessly. Later, there were more drinks, laughter, slurred speech, bad jokes, frequent visits to the bathroom. Sunlight woke me up the next morning. My head throbbed. I didn't remember getting into bed. 
I walked around the room like a zombie searching for my phone. Couldn't find it. Downstairs, in the living room, Logan and Tara were nowhere to be seen, and I got no answers after calling their names. The front door was open. The moment I stepped outside, a sudden fear swept over me. Best I can describe it. It was the alarm that goes inside of our body at the moment an earthquake starts. A survival instinct that screams at you to move to a safe spot. Except, nothing cataclysmic had followed. I stared around the front yard, wide-eyed, and moved slowly to where I fixed my cameras. As they were gone. My gut told me to get out of this place, to get in my car and just drive as far away as I can. And, at that moment, the needle finally appeared. I spiked movement directly above me and stepped aside just in time as it struck the ground. There it was in front of me. A giant soul needle. I couldn't believe my eyes. It reflected the daylight in a strange fluid-like way. The surface looked as smooth as mercury. And at the top, two hollow eyes gaped at me. It made absolutely no noise. I stepped back carefully, looking at it for a long moment, and then turned around and bolted back inside the house. When I gathered my courage to look through the window, the needle was still outside, hovering above the same spot. I went to the other window, and it mimicked my movement, flying to the right. Fuck this, I muttered. As I searched around for any sign of the Hudsons, I saw that the basement door was ajar. The steps creaked as I made my way down. It was dark. A narrow ray of light escaped through the drapes on the small window, but it wasn't enough to see inside the room. The smell reminded me a bit of the dentist's office. Logan? Tara? No answer. I fumbled in the dark for the light switch. I felt it under my fingers, and the white lights flickered to life. The first thing I saw was an operating table, like the ones you see in a hospital. Behind that was a wooden desk that stretched all along the south wall with various gadgets and tools I'd never seen before. And there were also surgical instruments spread on a white cloth on the desk. Next to them was a manila folder. The documents inside were in a weird foreign script, and there were pictures attached, including mine. I recognized some of the faces. They were UFO enthusiasts and paranormal investigators. The basement door shut closed, and a chill went down my spine. I turned around, folder in hand, to see Logan and Tara walk down the creeping steps. They both had the same inexpressive look on their faces, and a wolfish glimmer in their eyes. I grabbed one of the scalpels and held it up in what I hoped was a threatening way, but my hand shook visibly. That won't help, Logan said. Who are you? Did you drug me last night? I asked. They stepped closer. Back off, I'm warning you, I said. Then, Logan uttered a strange guttural sound and the scalpel slipped out of my fingers. My hands felt weak, so did the rest of my body. It seemed like an invisible force was pressing me down from all sides. I struggled to stay on my feet. I'm not giving up, I repeated to myself. With the last atom of my strength, I turned around and took another instrument from the table. I'm not sure what it was. Logan's eyebrow I saw raised itself slightly as if in surprise and terrorists did too at the exact same time. They looked strange, like watching dancers make a synchronized move. It was the first show of emotion, if you could call it that, since the two of them cornered me like predators in the basement. Then, the sound came again from the man's throat. Louder, harsher, like an avalanche, my legs bent on their own and I landed on my knees on the hard floor. What are you? I managed to say, 
before everything went black. When I came to my senses, I was on the operating table, naked, with my hands and feet tied. I felt weird. My body itched all around. Ah, welcome back, Teddy, Logan said. What have you done to me? The question came out slurred. They towered above me, staring directly into my eyes. Oh, I opened you up a bit, inserted a few things, zipped you up again. I even fixed some issues. You're welcome, by the way. And there won't be a scar. Don't worry. I've had years of practice, Logan said, forcing a slight smile. Inserted what? Let's just say, I can keep track of you now. Like, GPS, you know. But it's in your bloodstream, a part of you. And soon, I'll release you back into the wild. Logan said. Tara was oddly silent, her creepy stare still fixed on me. Why? I managed to say. Well, you see, you're wrong, Ted. I do care what insects think, how they think and behave, what drives them. I want to know everything. Something moved inside of me like electricity, and I felt the insides of my skull vibrate slightly. I grunted at the discomfort. Your body is still adjusting, Logan said. It was just too difficult for me to form a sentence. The needle. What is it? Tara and Logan answered in perfect unison. I, I am, am the needle. needle. The weird sensation in my head intensified and mixed with pure terror. I'll continue with this mouth so I don't confuse you, Logan said. He held up a syringe. It's time to sleep again. You won't remember any of this when you wake up. But we will be linked. Forever. I woke up in my car. It was parked on a dirt road near a highway. I heard the sound of vehicles swooshing in the distance. The bag with my cameras, night goggles and other stuff was in the back seat. Was I going somewhere? My phone showed that it was 11 a.m. Friday. Wait, I thought. Friday? I was pretty sure it was Tuesday the last time I checked. How did I manage to jump three days forward? I drove home confused. The missing time bugged me a great deal. The funny thing was, I had all the things I needed to piece the story together. My notes, Logan's email, etc. But they meant nothing to me. My brain just skipped them. I couldn't connect the dots. I did seek professional help by the way, but the doctor said there was nothing wrong with me. Months passed, and things started to change in my life. I became less interested in ufology and my blog. Gradually, I was more and more reluctant to talk about that stuff to people. In short, I didn't want to be the weird UFO guy anymore. In the following year, I even got engaged. Her name is Sandra. We met at a local yard sale, and I felt instantly drawn to her. When our eyes first met, she pierced deep into my soul and touched a nerve ending there. A cliché, I know, but it was love at first sight. We were the perfect fit as it turned out. The first couple of dates flew by without a dull moment, and we talked about everything from music to movies to life fuck-ups. It all felt right, and so we clung to each other, sewn together by fate. Or so it seemed. Life was good all in all, except for the recurring nightmares. I would dream of flying over fields and forests, cities and lakes, over vast oceans, and I could see every detail below if I wanted. The houses, the bird perch on a park bench, the waves rippling on the water. Is it the present? Is it the future? 
Time didn't matter. The dream would end with me falling from a great height, and I would jump awake just before hitting the ground. Several days ago, my life changed again. We were visiting Sandra's parents for a few days. They're just the nicest old couple you could imagine, and they treated me like their own son. So one evening, we're sitting in the living room, chatting away while the fire crackled in the hearth. Her mother was knitting a sweater. It was something she was very skilled at, and I already owned a colorful one she gifted me at Christmas. My eyes followed the movement of the two big knitting needles. It was mesmerizing to watch for some reason. I tried focusing on the conversation, but it was too distracting. Something zapped across my brain as I kept watching, like a brief electrical shock. Images started flashing before my eyes. I saw the Hudsons, the ruined lawn, the operating table, the needle. The holes poked in my memory hilt just enough for me to connect the dots. And for the terror to start seeping in. What's wrong, Ted? Sandra asked, squeezing my shoulder. I... I remember everything. Oh god. I remember. Ted, you're freaking me out. I paused to collect my thoughts. The missing time I told you about, remember? I think I know what happened to me. Sandra and her parents looked at me blankly. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that out loud. Well, what do you remember? Said my fiancé. The needle. There's a needle. Oh god. They've done something to me. I need to warn people. This, this thing needs to be stopped. The three of them stared at me for an uncomfortable moment. There it is, I thought. I've ruined it. Now, they'll think I'm crack-brained. But the look on their faces told a different story. And for the first time, I caught the same glimmer in their unblinking eyes. Then Sandra and her parents spoke in chorus. I am the needle. I fumbled to my feet and slowly took a step back. They rose from their seats. It was Sandra who spoke next, her voice cold and clear. We are all linked now, remember? There is no escape. You can run, but you'll come back to me. I grabbed my car keys and ran outside. I glanced nervously at the sky while driving. At moments I thought I saw a slim shadow on the asphalt or a silver slit in the cloudless sky. It's been four days since then, as I write this. I rarely leave my apartment anymore. And when I do, I'm always watching the sky. Every corner I turn, I'm expecting to see the needle there, waiting for me. By day, I'm just a scared little man. Can't even look other people in the eye. Too afraid of what I might see there. But at night, when I close my eyes, I'm high in the sky. And now I know, these are not just dreams. I see the world through the eyes of the needle, who are linked after all. I know what it wants, though I cannot express it, not in words. But the knowledge fills me with a deep sense of dread for the future of humanity and our planet. Someday soon, you'll feel the change. You'll feel the power that the needle, endlessly at work, will awake. In the starlit darkness, I fly over your schools and factories and empty parking lots. I poke holes in the soft earth in faraway fields. I break boulders on rocky mountain tops in a blink of an eye. I dive deep into the cold ocean and touch the bottom of the abyss below. I am the needle.